I'm here today with professors from law school, uh, Professor William McPherson, who in my time was known as the, uh, the uh, law school clinic guy and affectionately known as Billy Mac. And he's a graduate of UNM and been there for many years, can give us a history of law school. I'm also with, Pro with Professor Robert Desiderio, who was there in my time too, affectionately known as Desi, the famous contract professor. Uh, they were at the law school. Desi um, was there since 1967, and he's still there as a professor emeritus, still teaching. Even during the pandemic with masks and online, he's still there. Bill McPherson was a student when Desi came to um, UNM. Uh, he was there from 1963 to 1966, and from what I hear, he walked on <laughs> to the law school and uh, was a student and graduated and taught at the law school from 1970 to 2010, but he is also the inventor of the Guanajuato program, which is the a law school program that goes to that took students to Mexico and you still are teaching down in Mexico not anymore not anymore but he for years and years taught yeah. down there so they're two of our illustrious professors at the University of New Mexico Law School they will give us a little bit of history of that this year we'll be celebrating the 75th anniversary of the law school and um, there's going to be a celebration of that. So we'll um, probably end up with that. So can you tell us a little bit about the beginnings of the law school, how it was back then? Well, we can talk about the beginning of the law school. We weren't there back then, mm -hmm. but from talking with the early graduates and there is something called the history of the law school by then the late Professor Henry Weihofen, which many, all those students had uh, that describes that era. The law school was established in 1947. Right? It was not created without some controversy. Right? Members of the bar and the judiciary uh, did not think that a law school was needed, nor that it would be of sufficiently high quality. That being the case, it was established. Its originally facilities, if people who are still old enough know this, were in the, below the stadium seats of the old Zimmerman Field, uh, field which was the football stadium, right? across from Carlisle Gym, which is no longer there with it. It comprised of, I think, two classrooms, a couple of offices, and a one-room library. There were four faculty members, including the initial dean, great person, Dean Gazowicz, who was really the person who established the law school with it. That's how it started. It had to build a library. It didn't have funds to purchase a library. All the, li of the library books were contributed. So much so that in one year, 1948, the law school received both American Bar Association and Association of American Law Schools accreditation. One year. And that meant that they had to re acquire enough library materials to meet the minimum standards, which was at least 25,000 volumes back then, and it was done with it. That's how it was established. And it stayed in Zimmerman Fieldhouse till 1952. Why? Because it outgrew the space. In fact, as we all know from public schools and other places, there were barracks. <laughs> for classrooms. So in 1952, the original Bratton Hall was, was built with it, which was on main campus, just next to the field, to the president's house. That building 
enlarged now is sociology. That's it. That was the original uh, Bratton Hall. It was named after Judge Sam Bratton, who was the leading force on the regents that established the law school with it. That law building had three, cl two classrooms and a seminar room, I think, and it had a two-floor library. It held, was built for 100 students with it. And for those of us who know the building were around, and most famously, the basketball court that was next in, in next to the loss to the student lounge, and which became the originator importance of the law school basketball court with it. When the f law school moved into that building, there were nine faculty members. That's it. And it grew to almost 100 students. Uh, in the early years, it never got there. As Bill will mention, uh, in the early 60s, the graduating classes equaled nine students, 12 students with it. They were the numbers of graduates. So you would have 35 to 50 students enrolling, and through dropouts or suspensions, 9, 10, 11 would graduate with it. Right? We stayed in the, Dean Gausowitz retired in about 1957 or 58. Uh, in 1959, Vern Countryman, Dean Vern Countryman, became the dean. Let's see. And you were there then? No, I came afterwards, but Dean Vern Countryman had the reputation to, of building the quality more of the law school with it and bringing in additional faculty members. Let's see. So by the time he left in 1963, there were nine faculty members. That's it. And most of those faculty, or a good number of them, were the faculty that stayed on for a number of years. Right? Dean Countryman stayed till 63, and then in 66, are around there, Dean Tom Christopher becomes the dean. I mean, Bill was a student, I believe, when Dean Christopher was there, and Dean Christopher was the person who hired me with it. And at that time, we grew to 11 faculty members, including the dean. I recall faculty meetings sitting on the floor of the dean's office. I said, we were small enough to do that so that we didn't have to go into any other room uh, with it. But the law school then grew from the number that it was built for to about 150 students. The graduating classes still didn't grow proportionately, but it grew to about that size with it. And it outgrew the original Bratton Hall, that's it. And so through the efforts of Dean Christopher, he may have pushed the university and the legislature to build what is the present Bratton Hall on the North Campus, which opened in 1971. And its size was to, for 300 students. Right? Uh, it had, at that time, four classrooms, three classrooms, no, four classrooms, I'm sorry, with it, f faculty, offices, and a, and a library, obviously. Most importantly, it had the forum, right, which has been called the fifth classroom. Mm -hmm. All of the classrooms emptied on to the forum. With it. It's also been described, and I heard Tom Christopher say this, in a human physiological sense. 
The moot courtroom, which was in the center, was the heart. The library, which is to the north, was the brain. And the classrooms where the students came out and were the limbs uh, of it. And the thought and goal always was to build a community with it. So that students and faculty would be brought together. And you were there, and we were all there, and that occurred. Right. So that's the physical history. Uh, well, there'll be more that I'll go into. It's expansions. Mm -hmm. But that's what led to it. Mm -hmm. okay. Wonderful. That's a really good background of it. Now, Bill, I was really intrigued by you saying that you just kind of came and asked to go to law school and you were allowed to go? Well, <clears throat> almost like that. What it was, I was either going to go to dental school or then I thought, no, I'd have to go out of state. My wife had a good job, so maybe I'll go to law school. So uh, I took the exam, and uh, after that was reported, I just walked over there, and uh, I can't remember who it was, uh, one of the secretaries. Lou? Yeah, Lou, Lou Camp. Camp. Yeah, Lou Camp. I walked in there, and I said, I'm thinking about coming to law school. Would I be uh, uh, admitted? <clears throat> and I thought it'd be hard to get in. But uh, she looked up something and said, oh, no, no, you're more than welcome. In fact, you might be able to go to Harvard. And that impressed me, but I thought, no, nah, that's too expensive for me. So I started there. Uh, what was interesting for me was there was not this community relationship. Most of the students saw it as them against us. And they were pretty... I thought pretty hard on you. They tried to intimidate you to a certain extent. And here I'd been an ex-cop, been in a shootout, and they were intimidating me. And I thought, what is going on here? But they would, you had to stand up in class when they called your name, and then they'd start to ask questions of you. They gave the traditional lecture the first day that we were there that looked to the right and looked to the left and none of those will be there uh, and you got to be serious and professional and I think the truth of it the the big what I call classroom I don't you described it I think that when we started there were 60 or 70 of students in there but it uh, gradually fell off and I used to think that nobody left voluntarily except one or two friends. They uh, just didn't make it. And the thing is, they would tell you, you're out and don't apply to come back. There was no return. Now, there were a few exceptions. There was a, uh, a friend of mine whose aunt was a regent, and he got back in. <laughs> but I don't know if that's true, but I mean, he, it was just so, uh, uh, harsh there. Most of the students were happy to get C's. I mean, there was uh, not much. Uh, and I, as I recall of the original group, there was about 12 of us. Now there were two or three transfers from other law schools that finished up there. But uh, if you were a C or C plus, you were a good student. And then uh, those, there were a few that could brag, I never got a D or F. And that's about it. But there wasn't a lot of high, high grades. Now, I, uh, for me, it was, uh, I think there were other students that were more actively involved because uh, I was married, had a child, and I would go to class in the morning and go home and uh, babysit and study. And so I was less of the uh, social life there. But uh, I don't know. I, uh, I think that uh, probably one of the most important things that happened, as Beth Desi has already mentioned it, is I would say that the new deans came in and they started to uh, try to create a community, a family. And I think that was particularly true during the period of uh, Fred Hart but it was started before that. Uh, 
and uh, that was a positive change. Now, the only thing I laughed about was when uh, the spoke professor spoke, it was yes ma'am or yes sir, and you did what they wanted. Now they argue with you. <laughs> uh, anyways, I got out and went, went into practice. I spent most of my time with the Navajo tribe doing legal work for them. Uh, and which was the dean you'd mentioned his name? I'm terrible. Well, cool. first, first dean was Gauswitz, then Vern Countryman, followed by Tom Christopher. All right. When and I think the beginning of the change was through the efforts of Tom. Yeah, I mean, he had some ideas. You know, Fred Hart came out and spent a summer with us at the, uh, at the law office there with, uh, on the Navajo Reservation because he was trying to get involved with the Navajos. At one time, they were going to turn over all of the uh, recorded uh, sayings and singing of the medicine men out there and they were looking for a, a depository for it. So Fred came back out and we went over to a meeting with the medicine man. They were very friendly, but I don't think they trusted a white man. To now, now when you say Fred came out, because Fred, Dean Fred Hart was at the law school for many, many years. Yep. Well, he was, he was a professor then. And he came out to, I called him up and said, look, they're looking for a depository would the university be interested in the law school? And he said, sure. And so How that happened is, well, Fred was Boston College. He right? came out. And I test. was a student of his, mm -hmm. with him, and his research assistant. And so in 1966, Tom Christopher enticed him to come out as a visitor for one year. He never left. And what Tom also did was made, among many decisions, two very important. He appointed Fred the first director of admissions. And he asked Fred to become the director of the summer scholarship program for American Indians that started the summer program with it. And so Fred took those two over in 1967 right, with it. And obviously they carried over to after when he became dean with it. But it was Tom Christopher who foresaw that and asked Fred to do that. And you followed Fred out in 67. I followed Fred out in 67, obviously. It was through Fred's efforts that, that, that I followed Fred out. Uh, and then Fred becomes dean in 1971 through an amazing story that could never happen during this era. Right. Tom Christopher uh, re resigned, retired. He became the dean of Alabama. And so the university appoints a small committee. The faculty met in a faculty member's home, Leo Kanowitz's, excluded Fred. And we said, Fred's going to be the dean. And we went over and told the university. And Fred became the dean. Wow. Okay. That wouldn't happen anymore. <laughs> but that's 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 the reputation, the feeling, the trust, the love that the faculty had for Fred. That's it. And so he becomes the dean in 1971, just you know, as the new building is opening up. That's it. And so that becomes a sort of a pivotal change in the law school. Right. The building, Fred becoming dean, expansion of the student body, Fred's vision of student body should be more diverse, that the faculty ought to be more diverse. When we moved over, we were 12 faculty members. 
And for the years to come, we see this dramatic growth, innovation, change in the law school. And Bill, you were at the Navajo Nation, or right. Right? and how did you come to know Fred? Well, he came out, you, I was his boss, out, that was but I was his boss. Oh. <laughs> which was meaningless. He wanted something, and so I said, well, why don't you go down and work with the Navajo Supreme Court? And we arranged for housing and BIA there. And uh, he spent a lot of time talking with the Navajo judges. Uh, and uh, he seemed to f find it a positive experience, but he was in another building from where the law, uh, the law department was. So. I'd occasionally chat with him or see him on the weekends. Well, I think he was there for a month or something right. like that. And how did you find your way to the law school then? Well, they made a mistake. <laughs> One day they called me up. I had a job offer to go to work for a fairly good sized firm. And, well, they said, Look, when you're ready to leave, call us. That's what it was in Phoenix. And Tom called up and said, how would you like to come back to the law school? And I said, well, I'd be interested, what, what would I be doing? You'd be setting up a clinical education program. Now, the only guidance I got in those other things, is I said, what is that? It's something like legal aid. So I talked to my wife, she wanted to come home. She's from New Mexico. And I thought, why not? And Tom basically said, look, come and work for us for three to five years. And if it doesn't work out, I'll find you a job here in Albuquerque if, if you want to stay with one of the firm. So we said, yeah. And uh, I came down. And I always wondered how Tom figured out I was the one. But he wrote a very kind letter about me. That he gave me a copy to the regents or to the president about, I was a wonderful guy, but that was about it. And one of the things that later on was interesting is, who was it again? The secretary? Lou Camp. Lou Camp. One day I was walking into one of those meetings in the dean's office, and Lou met me out in the, where the secretaries were, and said, hey, I want you to know you didn't graduate number one in the class. There was, there was a math error. So I said thank you and kept on walking. <laughs> but Lou was. She was a good person. <laughs> well, she became. We, was Lou there when? No, it was at. Lou, Lou was the student's yeah. source. Yeah. When the students needed anything, it was with Lou Camp. <laughs> she was the. Um, Bill says, we're the secretaries. There was one secretary. Right? Well, who else was on this? And then Lou became the registrar. Oh. I mean, and then there was a second secretary. But Lou ran everything during those, well, even through the middle 70s at least. And, uh, with it. it was Lou who the students would, would go to. So you are, so then that's when the law uh, school um, program started the for, clinic for the clinic. Well, it got, yeah, it started off slowly because nobody in the faculty or the, uh, knew what it was. I mean, literally, they didn't have a clue other than it was like legal aid, and some of them hated legal aid. But, uh, well, I thought, hey, this is the ideal spot. They don't know what they want. I'll do what I want. Well, what was the underlying idea, though, to give students experience, to get them out in the community? What was the... Uh, it's two parts. I mean, I, I agree with Bill. When Bill came, which was 1970. I mean, there were lots of discussions about what is this? But, but Pincus was around then, wasn't he? Pincus had uh, funded a small yeah. grant to pay my salary, right. but we got a big grant from him later on after but we But Pincus was with 
an organization dealing with clinical legal education. It was just emerging. Right? And Fred was aware of this. I said. But no one knew what it was. I said. Schools like us had extern programs, legal aid programs with it. And so our thought was learning or teaching experience ought to be more than the classroom typical book learning. It ought to be experiential learning, which included having to deal with clients and the issues clients have, both legally, psychologically, emotionally, and how you as a future lawyer were to deal with this. That's what was ultimately behind it all. Uh, uh, with it, but it was Bill by himself, right? Yeah. And then you hired Peggy. Uh, no, not right away. Uh, but uh, yeah, she was pretty much in the second. In the in the in the new building downstairs, towards the library exit. There was an office or two, and that was the clinic. In the hallway. In the. And, and that was the clinic. But what I think made it what it was is something that he pushed upon us. And don't let him under, I was dean with him there too. Bill would walk in and say, this is what I want. <laughs> but what we did is what something no other school in the country did. We required the students every student for graduation to take clinic. And originally it was one semester, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, one three-hour course. One three-hour, and then it expanded to what it is. But it was the first school in the country that required not just a simulation or an extern, but live client representation of individuals in need. And most of the clients at the time were university students, weren't they? Yeah. It, unlike what it is now, or maybe when you were there, Sharon, it was a general practice clinic. Right? It wasn't different kinds of clinics. Well, there was some division in it, but <clears throat> what it was, I thought, well, <clears throat> uh, there was a lot of talk when I came when you researched it, about uh, the law schools owe a duty to the community, and so they're going to be legal aid. And I said, no, we're not going to do that. Our duty is to uh, uh, graduate competent lawyers ready to t take some of the basic legal problem. So I started to make the argument, it's a bridge from the academics to the real world. And uh, it seemed to work, I mean, for a while. And I insisted that they had to have contact with clients of some kind. So uh, we tried to have a general law office, but I limited it to the uh, very basic cases. That I, I figured that as a young lawyer, you might have five types of cases, basic cases. So we, we pretty much picked those. And uh, then I uh, started to think, well, now we need to draw in the academics, so we'll create uh, courses, practical skills courses. So we started to develop, you know, uh, litigation, uh, negotiation, and some other courses. Trial practice? Trial practice, and things like that. Interviewing. And interviewing and counseling. And we even had a psychiatrist for a while. Bob Sinescu. Who? Bob Sinescu. Yeah, come over <laughs> and uh, talk. He was interesting. Well, Bob was the original chair of the Department of Psychiatry at UNM Medical School. And he spent a year with us. There was other people that came. But it slowly took hold. <laughs> yeah. And it, when did it become what it was when I was there, which was a DA clinic? 
where he actually went down and represented the state? Well, uh, what it was, was I got to thinking one time is, and I told Fred, look, we've got a separate criminal defense. Why don't we see about a uh, prosecution experience? So Fred and I went down and talked to the assistant DA down there. He was one of our ex-students and said, you know, we'd like to set up a program. They provided the space, we provided the furniture, and we had one of the faculty down there with the students, plus a, a lawyer who we paid for, who was uh, also, well, uh, assistant DA. In fact, for years I carried an assistant DA car, because I would go down there and help out or fill in. And then towards the end, uh, the pro the program was practical because you got to go to court, you know, and argue, yeah. But uh, the faculty didn't like it. Well, not all, some of them. They're all liberals up there. <laughs> you don't prosecute people, you defend them. <laughs> well, it was a very diverse faculty, and that was one of the hallmarks of the law school. What, ha what happens then starting in 71, when we're in the new building with it and Fred Steen, the faculty grows and becomes diversified. I see. You know, it grew to in the 20s during the tenure. And people like Ann Bingham, Justice Minzner, Ruth Kavnat, right? Helene Simpson, Leo Romero, Joe Goldberg, Cruz Reynoso, just Mike Norwood, Richard Gonzalez, Jose Martinez were hired during this period. With it. Lee Teitelbaum, with it. I mean, Garrett Flickinger. And so that's a wide spread of different kinds of people. Right? Some of whom are clinicians, some of whom are not clinicians. After a while, it didn't make much difference uh, with it. And so that grew. Right? The student body grew in size, but also grew in diversity. With it. With it. So that the view of Fred and the faculty was the law school should reflect the state. We are the only state law school. And our obligations were, first of all, to the state, both in the students we trained and also our contributions. We'll talk about that, maybe. And so the student body both grows in size and the number of Hispanic women, uh, African-American students grows. With it. it no longer was the typical law school class that you saw around the country. So that grows at the same time. Innovation comes in. I mean, I joked with Bill once the other day, and after a while it was hard. You wouldn't see the same first class, first year classes, the same every year. We were experimenting, trying different things all the time. Bringing in, of course, international law, taking it out, putting in family law. Listen, just saying, you know, it's not just the subject matter it's important. It is the process, the analytical skills, and the relationship to society in the whole that matters. So that goes on during this period. So incoming classes then had a personality and a, a mixture? Absolutely. And it became more and more diversified. Right? Absolutely. I, I've and always you, believed, and, yeah. and we know, I mean, you could, we know the graduates by the class because the, the, of the personality of the class. You know, you had 1973, which produced a lot of judges. You had 1974, which resulted in the famous uh, what happened when people took their clothes off? Run around news. What? <laughs> what? 
but streaky. Pretty streaky. Yeah. All right. yeah, that class all right, was it. Each class had a personality was it. I think you should also keep in mind that they developed in the summer an Indian law program where right. the, uh, uh, American Indians yeah, the summer could program. come there and get sort of a preparatory to go to law school. And a significant number would stay with us there. And uh, uh, I thought that was an important program. I'd go down and talk to them informally. Uh, who was the first director down? Bob Bennett? No. The or director. Sam? Sam. Well, Sam was the second Bob. Yeah. Bob. Sam would invite me down to talk to them because I'd been on the Navajo. Now, you got to remember, there was quite a bit of tension between the Pueblos and the Navajos because the Navajos were the raiders. So he'd get me in there and then ask questions to try to get me befuddled or something. but. Uh, I thought that the Indian program was a very important contribution, not only to this law school, but to law schools generally. Well, it opened the doors to the Native Americans. What you had were three programs that developed. First was the summer program for American Indians. That was the precursor of all the programs nationwide. Now, is this happening at other law schools, or no. was this unique? This was unique. In 1967, it started. What happened nationwide was another program called, developed called CLEO, the Council of Legal Education Opportunity. Right? That was a summer program to introduce and to provide pre-law school introduction to study to all students of uh, backgrounds, Hispanic, uh, African Americans, even Native Americans, but the Indian program had established that. That follows nationwide, and we were part of that. But we thought that that wasn't enough. So we started our own summer program in addition to the American Indian Law Program, right, called the Summer Institute for students right, who maybe didn't meet the credentials, but who wanted to go to law school as a preparation. And so you had that program going with it. And it was through those three programs that our pro student body increased. Obviously, the summer program for for Indian students was not only for us. I mean, go back a statistic. When that program started, there were 11 Native American lawyers in the country. In the country. Uh -huh. uh, the now the numbers are in the thousands. A great percentage of them still to today come through this, now it's called the pre-law summer program, PLSI. Mm -hmm. I see. And so you had those three programs going on to diversify our law school as well as nationwide this was going on. So it. there were lots of things going on at the law school that oh. were innovative oh. because the clinic yeah. was, innovative. Is, was totally innovative. It was unique it was the, unique. Way, we, it was the th way we approached it. It is now normal in the university. It's, almost, it's required by the ABA, but it was unique. Our Indian program was unique. Our own summer program was unique uh, with it. Our playing with the curriculum w w was unique. I uh, think there was a period of time that it was important that, uh, particularly with Fred, if you had a new idea, he'd oh. say, sure, go ahead and try it. If it fails, it fails but he would support it. And, you knew. And so, so Fred was really kind of the light that shined down upon... Uh, there's no question. I mean, he, that, yeah. that's why I said. He, he was, if you will, the person for the time. He was innovative. Right? Yet Fred never came in and said, let's do this. 
you know, we knew Fred's vision, and it, the fact that he would do it, and as Bill said, and would continue to the law school for years, is if he came into the dean's office, it was yes. Right? No meant there was a reason we couldn't do it. Right? We didn't have the money. Yeah, we'll talk. One of the problems the law school has faced since its formation to today, in comparison to our peers, is lack of resources. We do not have, and we never had sufficient resources. Right? And so there had to be a lot of financial. Or financial, I'm talking financial about resources. financial resources. Our faculty was always in the bottom quarter and even lower of all salaries nationwide, yet they didn't leave. Well, when I was there, there was a sense of uh, camaraderie among the faculty. Yes. Uh, you know, kind of family, kind of. Well, Everybody was there to sort of bolster the student, help send you to where you needed yeah. to go. How did that come about? Part of it is, again, just the hiring process with it. I had a couple points there, but from the 70s up and through middle 80s or so, but especially 70s, 80s, most of us were of similar age. We may have been diversified, but we were similar age. We had children of similar age. So we became friends in more than a professional sense. We, we, under, we argued with each other, but his friends do uh, with it. And we, we understood and we worked with each other to develop what it is. I mean, it was a shared common goal that, that we had. I mean, with the notion that first important goal was teaching. Right. When I came, the Tom said, look, I, I'm not interested in you getting a national representation reputation. I want you to work here for the school to build this into a successful clinical program. And I think that for a long time was the emphasis was on teaching and very there was no pressure to really publish that I can remember. But if you look at the history, there's an extreme amount of quote scholarship, different kinds. It's not just the big law review article. But there's an extreme amount going on. But there was no pressure. The pressure, and it was not only a pressure from up top, it was a peer pressure on teaching. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and the faculty created many, uh, like I, I'm thinking about Pam Minsner's, Justice Pam Minsner's book on... on um, Future interest. Right. I mean, and she, I mean, I don't know where that is on a national level, but that was certainly available to us there and other publications. You had something for the law uh, clinic students. Yeah. Kind of a manual for us Office to Office manual, from. yeah. Right. Nobody followed it. What? Uh, yeah, I was, <laughs> I, so, I was associate dean during the period of this time. And, and, and so I was involved in some, some of this, but one thing that happened that didn't happen in another law school, over half of our classroom teaching was by our own teaching materials. Yeah. That not help. published materials. Not the class the case books. It's a more practical. Practical, but but in the sense of being academic. But but the notion of what is scholarship was more than just publishing the law review article and writing the book. I mean, that was all important. Don't downplay that. But there were other, you know, there were a lot of briefs that faculty wrote. As the only law school, we became very involved with the bar. So you would write a bit. And so, you know, amicus briefs for different or, or cases. Or you'd be working with someone as a consultant or just as a volunteer, and, and you'd work on some stuff. But you know, I think you ought to uh, think of how dramatic a change that was, because when I was a student, 
the faculty would in class say, we're going to be the Harvard on the Rio Grande. That was a common phrase. And even I, as a student, would go look at their library and say, no way are you going to be the Harvard on the Rio Grande. Uh, but uh, that idea uh, and that change, I thought was the most, uh, the best thing, and the reason I stayed on is it was open to new ideas. There was no, uh, uh, we're not trying to be imitate Harvard or anybody else, we're going to be our own law school. And I thought that was very important. Yeah. Now, sure. though, you were there for many years, and Desi, you're still there. Do you both have a sense of where the law school is now? They're celebrating 75 years. Where is the law school today? Well, today, I, personally, I would say a lot of the notion of community still exists. I mean, with this proviso in a minute. And, and if you talk to members of the bar who are grads and those students, they would say the same thing. They still are pleased with our grads in that sense. But it, change occurs. And change is good. Often. The, all the faculty that were there during this period, through the middle, actually through almost 2,000 are no longer there. Right? And so it's a whole new cadre. And you know, in the last two years, there may, uh, this is our, I'm not sure the exact number, but about nine new faculty members. We have 32 faculty members now. Think of that, 32 for a student body of 315 to 20. Only Yale has a better ratio. But if nine of them are, are new, that's a fair percentage. And so it's a matter of when new faculty members coming in, how do they get integrated into this culture that at least we pride uh, with it. And so that's what I see right now. It's not just that change has occurred, just the difference in, in in who the faculty are. Student body size is the same. The relative makeup of the students are the same. Still 51% or so of women. Still 40% as hypothetical or approximately uh, minority backgrounds. So, uh, you know, academically wise, credential wise, even though Peter Winograd will fight with me all the time on this. Peter's still next door to me. <laughs> Peter's still there. <laughs> you know, the credentials are still basically the same. You know, you know this changed that. So that's the same. Mm -hmm. uh, the clinic has changed substantially because it's no longer just the general practice. There, there, there are just different kinds of clinics. Environmental clinic, economic justice clinic, Indian uh, uh, clinic, uh, community lawyer, uh, different kinds of clinics. Uh, I think. Do you ever go back and visit the clinics, Phil? Not anymore. I mean, uh, I sort of went off in a different direction with Mexican law. Uh, but I think the change has been good. Uh, it brought in new ideas. Now, it uh, uh, wouldn't fit my definition everything, but uh, that's, that's life. Now, uh, I remember when we came, it was the old guys that we were old geezers, you know, we were trying to change. And now I think we're the old geezers and we don't like change. <laughs> and, uh, but I do see, I have a grandson that graduated this last May. Uh, I think he got a good education, but I think COVID had a terrific impact, particularly on live client cases in the clinic. I mean, it seemed to me that, and I thought that was too bad, but it was the nature. Uh, well, that would really change your, uh, that change. I cannot describe, I taught contracts 
in, in 2020, in the fall of 2020, during, we started with one live class a week. Each first year class could come in once a week, but they could not overlap. So the only people in were one section of the first year class. I said, some of the upper class clinic had to come in. No faculty, because you came in to teach and you had to leave. And so you did not have that interaction going on that you're aware of, that we're all aware of. And it still exists. I walked into the law school yesterday, uh, I mean, sorry, yeah, yes, on Monday yesterday to pick up something. I didn't see anybody. Well, that's a big change. I mean, I didn't see, I, I didn't see anybody. I mean, there were a few students around, but I didn't see a faculty member. I didn't see anybody. Wow. Because the forum is still there. That's it's still, still the there. heart of the law school, and it was filled with students all the time. And it's still when a class comes out, but you don't have 300 students there, or at least half of them at the same time. COVID has had great impact on that. And I think it's, uh, there is an advantage, regardless of what the students think, to having direct contact with the professor, whether they love him or hate him is part of the practice of law. You got to deal with everybody. So it's, uh, it's re really unfortunate, I think, that, uh, but I think, what are you going to do? You can't uh, change. Hopefully, uh, it'll go back. Uh, the, the professor is an important element of contact directly with the students. Yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, <laughs> There are other aspects we didn't talk about last time that grew too. The Natural Resources Center, which is nationally recognized with the Natural Resources Journal. The Transboundary Water Institute, the Al Utten Institute, all these grew. The Institute of Public Law and Services. You remember, where that building is right now was really and owned by the bar. Oh, it, it is owned. By it was the bar yes. foundation, okay. and the bar association was originally located there. And then the court of appeals was there. The court of appeals is still there. No, they have their own Only next building, building but, but right they, next door. Right next door was the Albuquerque. Uh, part of the Court of Appeals. No school in the country had their Court of Appeals whereby the justices would come in and out and help and would participate in times with us. They still do, but it was, right? And then the Institute of uh, Law Services was upstairs. Now it has that whole building uh, with it. Yeah. Well, let's sort of end this up with what is planned for this big celebration. Can you tell us, do you? I am a member of the committee. No, I cannot. <laughs> because we are meeting tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but the, this much we know. The plan is not just a celebration, but a year of events. I mean, not just parties or socials, but lecture series you know, with it. You know, we have uh, the Sims lecture, right? and, and, and that. We have the Chavez lecture, using that. Having faculty lectures, having CLE programs, with it. as well as, obviously, uh, what I will call social gatherings of the alums and the bar. Well, and that's another thing that the law school had, the Sims, lecture series the year one of the years i was there was justice sandra day o'connor right. now to have somebody from the supreme court come to new mexico that is sort of reminiscent of harvard on the rio grande because yes. she yeah. made quite an impression on all of us right and, and at one point we had scalia i mean uh, uh with uh, 
it's, we've tried, I know this, in more recent years, but it's hard to get Supreme Court justices on, okay. on, on their calendars. Mm -hmm. uh, with it. But doing things like that, all part of this celebration. Well, I can certainly say that when I was there, from 19, oh gosh, 92 to 95, I think, I relished interacting with the faculty. And I was a non-traditional student, the way you were. Yeah. You know, I had family and all that. But the support that the faculty offered to me as that, and encouragement, is an invaluable and resource to students. That is so uh, underplayed, well, Desi's mentioned it, but that important that we're going to be a family here. And uh, I thought that uh, that was one of Fred's, at least he used to talk about it, and one of his important contributions. But I think that also started with Tom. And here, I remember they would have parties all the time. At his house. Yeah, at his house and other places. But it got so, uh, for the young faculty member, I couldn't afford the babysitting costs <laughs> to go to all these. And I thought, what are we going to do? But that, that was a, a, a real important thing, is to bring the faculty together. Even, even the, the old traditionalists and the young rebel, you know, and talk. And uh, the other thing that was gradually evolved, there were unwritten rules of how you dealt with each other in the faculty and in person. And uh, I thought it showed the evolution of a community where it started to create its own values and its own rules. And uh, every now and then someone would br uh, break a rule and we'd all be upset, a little bit at least. <laughs> A little peer pressure, huh? No, we never said anything. I never said anything, but I thought, hey, that's not, no personal attacks. Uh, and that was a big, I don't think you realize, that's a big uh, rule among faculty. Um, uh, yeah, I, I agree with that, because I never, to this day, have seen, experienced any of that. Any, well, that's a wonderful tribute to the, to the law school. And I thank you both. I can't tell you how much I even learned today about the law school and how, how far it goes back and how it evolved to what it is today. And you were both great parts of that. Well, thank you. So thank you so much. Is there anything you'd like to say in closing? Why, well, I never without an ending word. <laughs> That's, that's the problem of a theme. professor. <laughs> Never without an ending word. I always say, look at what our grads have, graduates have contributed to this state. And look at the judges, the justices, the federal, governor, the attorney generals, right? a secretary of the interior, right? that's it. the past just... Uh, American Museum of Indian Arts, Kevin Gover. Look at all the contributions that our grads have made to the state and to the nation. This small school and what it has done. It is amazing. Right. Yeah. I have nothing to add, you know. I intended to be there three to five years and then go back into practice. And I guess I enjoyed it so much that I just stayed on and all of a sudden it was time to retire. That's great because I really enjoyed clinic. I mean, I think that's a valuable part of our whole education. Yeah. And I thank you both for this oral history that would go on for the ages for other people to hear and enjoy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.